Welcome to ResGen's Giving Life Podcast, stories and conversations about life in Christ, everyday discipleship, and exploring ways that we as men can give life to others. My name is Tom Henderson, the founder of ResGen, and today's show is going to be a fun one. Before we get into it, though, I do want to remind you that we are getting real close to this year's ResGen Men's Summit happening on Saturday, January 29, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time here in Sioux Falls. It takes place both in person and online, so I hope you're able to join us for a day full of impact with former NFL player Sam Acho, Sports Spectrum podcaster Jason Romano, Pastor Sam Collier from Hillsong Atlanta, myself, and comedian Johnny W. For more information and to get your in-person or live stream tickets, which by the way are only $30, visit resgen.org. All right, my guest today is a friend of mine who was the campus pastor at the University of Sioux Falls back when I was a student there almost 25 years ago. And the crazy thing, he is still there today and is now the campus pastor for my son. Dennis Toom is a husband, a father, a grandfather, and has invested over 30 years of his life into the lives of thousands of college students. And on today's show, Dennis and I chat about a variety of topics, including some of the most significant changes that he's seen in college students over the last 30 years, how men can wrestle with and figure out the role they play in God's kingdom, and what he's doing to finish strong in the race that God called him to run. We also talk about a topic that the church doesn't deal with very well, divorce, and what he learned about himself, the church, and the Lord as he journeyed through his own experience with his divorce. You've tuned into a good episode, my friends. Here's my conversation with Dennis Toom. Dennis Toom, welcome to ResGen's Giving Life Podcast. It's good to be here. Great to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, man. This is when you said yes to come on, coming on here. I just I, I was immediately filled with joy, and I thought we could we could take this in a whole bunch of different directions today. <laughs> yeah, we'll try, I'll try to rein in my ADD and and uh, and my warped sense of humor, and try to keep things going in the right way. Here, so. All right. Well, I think a, I think a good place to start is just how long you've been a campus pastor, uh, yeah. specifically at at the University of Sioux Falls, and as I shared in the intro, uh, you know, so you were my campus pastor uh, <laughs> when I came on campus yeah. back in 1995, and now it's fun because my son Isaiah, uh, who's a sophomore, you're now his campus pastor, and my other son, who's going to be uh, most likely at USF in about 18 months, I'm just wondering, you know, are you, are you going to be his too? But but you've seen so much uh, in the lives of college students. Yeah, over the yeah. last you know thirty years. I mean, because yeah. you've been at thirty years, correct? Right, right. Be thirty-one in January. Thirty-one yeah. years uh, yeah. of of campus pastoring, seeing so many different trends, so many different things go on with college students. Um, tell me some of the the most significant things that you've seen as far as like changes or challenges or whatever. Like, sure. what are, what's some of the yeah. most significant things that you've seen in the life of the college students? Well, of course, the most obvious is the role of social media in the lives of students and how that has changed. When I started at USF, I didn't even have a computer on my desk. Uh, <laughs> and then the next year they gave me one. And, and, but that's, you know, so for me, uh, I'm always behind the students technology-wise. But to j just see how that's formed their, their spiritual lives, uh, mm -hmm. their access uh, to music, to, to podcasts, to preachers. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, everybody knew, every student knew who Billy Graham was. And it was probably 15 years ago when uh, I mentioned Billy Graham in class and a student said, who's that? Oh. And now it's, you know, that's not even a factor. Uh, Billy Graham doesn't, that, that's, that's history, ancient mm -hmm. history. I think so one of the trends that you've seen is just the technology. One is the, the other is a different style of, of influencer uh, that has a profound impact on their lives. Uh, and, and then celebrity preachers in the sense of not necessarily being big names, but uh, everybody having their, their small circle of influence. So mm -hmm. you have megachurch pastors from around the world, uh, but also from the city that have an impact on their lives. Uh, so in a sense, you'd say almost like a competitiveness. There's a lot of voices coming into their world. Um, and, and, and so I think students have to make a lot of tough choices as to what, to discern what's, what's God's will, what's, mm -hmm. To discern the voices among many. There are many Christian voices out there right now. And uh, 
I sometimes as a as a pastor, I look at that and say, I would like to steer them more towards this voice and less away from this other voice. But um, it's 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 definitely it's a call to prayer. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you find yourself praying a lot about students that they'll they'll hear the right voice in the many voices that are coming at them. And the same the other trend, of course, is music. Um, Thirty years ago, we were still we would when we'd set up for chapel, we would bring out the hymn books. <laughs> yeah. Now you have to explain to a student what a hymn book is, and you almost have to take them to a museum. And 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 so an old hymn. I had a one time we did a jazzed up version of it as well with my soul. Uh, a classic hymn, right? Yeah. And a couple of days later, a student came up to me and said, "You know that song? It's good with my my spirit. That was pretty interesting. How do where do I find that? You know?" And 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 so you, just just no assumption about what people are listening to. Uh, mm-hmm. And and so music has changed uh, the, the 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 way they get their music, and uh, so there's just not a unified voice anymore. However, there's the same spirit at work, and in many ways, I see God raising up a generation that mm. is really a privilege to still be a part of that work of seeing God raising up this next generation of, of spiritual leaders. Yeah. So then, uh, the University of Sioux Falls, and I, and and I didn't have this on the list of questions that I sent you, yeah. but it just it just kind of popped in my head. So the University of Sioux Falls has never had like a mandatory chapel rule. Like you right. go to a lot of right. you go to a lot of private institutions, a lot of uh, Christian colleges, and they will have mandatory chapel requirements, whether that be yeah. um, you're expected to be at everyone or you're given like three skips a semester yeah. or whatever. But USF has never had that a part of its right of its kind yeah. of plan. So how has like is that something that you that you wish was there? Do you do you love that it's not yeah. there? Um, what are the the good things about that? What are some of the challenging things about that? Well, you know, my, my colleagues that have mandatory chapel, uh, you know, I've had these conversations with them, and I actually graduated from a college where it was mandatory chapel, okay. and you'd have a captive audience and a lot of bad attitudes <laughs> and a lot of homework being done in chapel. Uh, but on the other hand, the the plus side of mandatory chapel is you get to create a curriculum. And sooner or later, uh, there, you're going to find something that's helpful to just about every student. Voluntary chapel, on the other hand, uh, is uh, you, you're trying to be responsive to needs. Um, the, the, the way we program at USF is we do things throughout the week. So there's small groups, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, InterVarsity, mm-hmm. uh, dorm Bible studies, and then we also do Thursday night worship, which is more more music oriented at nine o'clock, which is a great time for students. And then Tuesday morning chapel when mm-hmm. the campus community can slow down. But again, uh, it's you have to be more creative. And I can't always say uh, I nail it. You know, uh, uh, the students are busy, and we we work as a community. So I am very thankful for InterVarsity and Fellowship of Christian Athletes mm-hmm. and for our student leaders that's on Thursday night, just grab a guitar and they sing together and they pray together and they uh, and uh, they they take care of themselves on Thursday night. They pray and lead one another. Uh, so I feel like I'm more like a conductor rather than a, a pastor sometimes as I'm trying to get everybody to play their their part in this mm-hmm. great piece. Uh, and and, uh, and that's, I guess, what I love about my job. And as I pray about fading off into the horizon here because I'm <laughs> approaching my 69th birthday, uh, my prayer is that whoever takes my place, uh, that we ease that person into the job uh, and is able to understand this this balancing. You know, you really is. I love being a part of the greater kingdom of heaven, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the working with pastors in the community and uh, seeing yourself as a little piece of a big big picture mm-hmm. and and being a part of that team is a, a privilege. You grow up, you always want to, you know, when I was a kid, I was always enamored with spiritual giants, right? We called them that, the yeah. Martin Luthers, the whatever, John Wesley's. And and we were, our ego is drawn to these huge impact players. Mm. And there's a something very spiritually unhealthy about that because I, 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 I came to learn, you know, that it, it, too much of being a spiritual giant or even that great William Carey line, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. Uh, if you're not careful, your ego side sabotages your ministry. Yeah. Uh, and we need to be willing to play a, an assist role. We need to be the Scotty Pippen to the Michael Jordan, which yeah. 
course, a lot of my students don't even know who either of those guys are anymore. <laughs> yeah. So you have to right. change that name too. Yeah, <laughs> right. But but to to willing to to play and assist to be an assist, uh, to to do assists in the kingdom of heaven, mm-hmm. oftentimes doesn't get stressed enough in in our theological training. Yeah, especially. I mean, we like to preach about First Corinthians chapter twelve, right? Where it's, <laughs> it's just like we all have this role to play, yeah. and the I can't say of the year, and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. you know how that how it flushes itself out and how it lives itself out is often you know different yeah. than maybe how it comes out of oh, of our yeah. of our mouths, right? And 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 I and I would suspect that there's there's some times though where it is a little bit challenging when. You know, students can drop any podcast or any sermon within a second of these "quote unquote" celebrity pastors. Which, by the mm-hmm. way, I really don't think those terms should be brought together. I don't think those <laughs> words are ones that should be yeah. used together in a sentence. It is kind of an oxymoron. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It's totally. But um, but I, I would suppose that there is there is some maybe pressure at times to feel like, okay, how mm-hmm. do we make chapel a can't miss experience when? Right. They they don't have to miss anything because of the computer that you had to wait a year to get on your desk that they carry yeah. around in their pockets. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, you know, the the future belongs to the flexible, and and uh, God has to uh, to really uh, be our our guide in mm-hmm. these things. Yeah. So okay, so you bring up the word flexible, and that is uh, what you have really you've you've lived that out in in all the different <laughs> roles that you've played in in your yeah. ministry career. Yeah. So like in your career, you've been campus pastor obviously for the last 30, 31 years, uh, professor, military mm-hmm. chaplain, interim pastor. You've been involved in prison ministry, um, and it's probably things the list there that that could continue to go on. So how how did how do you feel like God? Um, like, how how did he really unpack or unfold all these different roles for you? Yeah. And how did you know, like, what God was calling you to do? Because I think a lot of guys struggle with, you know, how do how do how do I wrestle with and kind of figure out my role in the kingdom? Yeah, and yeah. whether they be in full time ministry or or not. Yeah, yeah. I uh, always tell my students uh, in ministry class. I have a teaching class called Foundations of Professional Ministry, and I basically say, "Don't do what I did." <laughs> Uh, I kind of backed into everything. Uh, I had a dream. I, I went, because I got, I had my classic college come to Jesus experience. Uh, bad night of heavy drinking uh, led to a blackout, led to the flashing red lights in your rearview mirror, and mm-hmm. a really bad reminder that your life is going in the wrong direction. So I had my come to Jesus moment as a sophomore in college, spring of my sophomore year, mm-hmm. and I started rebuilding. Well, I found, first thing the Lord started to tell me was, you know, you probably should start going to class. <laughs> and so I always say I didn't really go to college my first two years. I just paid with tuition. Uh, and so I had to start over. So I transferred. So I transferred from a state school and living in a fraternity house to a very conservative Christian college with mandatory chapel, dress codes, room inspections, uh, everybody carrying their Bible around. Wow. Uh, and I loved it. And I also came to despise the uh, being cramped, you know, mm. and... So from that, though, that wonderful experience of uh, being in a Christian college with so many rules, I developed a heart for the people on the edge, and and because that's where I felt. And even when I was in seminary, I felt like, why am I doing this? I don't really think this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but God, I think many times God uses um, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel to to say, just pursue that. And then you find out there's a right turn that's coming, and there's a different light that that God is actually leading you to. So I, in in starting to go in one direction, and having a heart for this, all of a sudden military ministry opened up. Hmm. And in military ministry, I was uh, pursuing that and going ready. To, I'd sold my house, and we were ready to be shipped out. And a bureaucratic glitch held everything up. And while I was waiting for that, an opening at the penitentiary happened in Sioux Falls, and I'd always had a heart for in, prison inmates. So I thought, I'll just pursue that while I'm waiting for the Navy. And if I don't like this, I'll go I'll go anchors away and go do the Navy thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I first day on the job at the penitentiary, I loved it. Within two weeks, I had the biggest prison escape in the history of the prison. Uh, I had all kinds of excitement. The adrenaline kicks in. I loved what I was doing. And then the Navy was ready to call me. And I said, I'll stay in the reserves. So I did 20 years in the Navy Reserve mm. and had great experiences doing that, but realized that in pursuing one thing, it prepared me to open for a whole different door that opened up. Yeah. So then I'm at the penitentiary, loving what I do, and not wanting to leave. And then I get this phone call from what was then called Sioux Falls College, 
saying, our campus pastor left, left, would you like to talk about this? And I almost said no. And I thought, well, it doesn't hurt to check it out. So I interviewed, and in fact, it was 31 years ago next week that I interviewed, yeah. Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh-huh. And I really didn't try that hard. And and because I liked what I was doing. And yeah. I thought, well, whatever. And, and uh, there's a guy I could mention name, I won't, but he yeah. and I kind of got into this little debate like, well, yeah, well, how about that? You know, and, and he was one of the, on the search, you, you should never offend the people on the search committee. <laughs> But he and I got in this little argument, not argument, debate. Yeah, sure. Anyhow, they th- in our house, Dennis, we call it intense fellowship. They, so, like, <laughs> exactly. <that's> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, we were, quite, we were a little in, more intense. And don't do that on a job interview. Yeah. Well, anyhow, they turned around and offered me the job, and I, I almost turned it down. And then Tex, and a lifer, he was a bandito who killed somebody at Sturgis in a big fight, and he's doing a life sentence, and he's now my secretary. And he was a, a great guy when you got him sober and clean. Like well, I found that many inmates are just fine when you keep them the drugs away, yeah. keep the drugs away from them. Anyhow, Tex just pointed me and just said, you got to take that job. He, he, I took my spiritual direction from a lifer doing a double life sentence for murder, kidnap, <laughs> kidnap, murder. Right? Yeah. And Tex was absolutely right. I, huh. I needed to do it, and and God totally provided when when I left the penitentiary with new ministers that came in and did a better job than I could do, and I and um, I said I, I went to USF, and then from there other things spun off, like being able to be a prison uh, a, a, a police chaplain. Mm-hmm. I was actually helped get the, started with a police chaplain. I was part of that original team of police chaplains, and I did some hospital chaplaincy work on the side and. And then interim doors opened up where I could fill in churches. Yeah. And the great thing about being an interim pastor is you can say what you think. You say, if you don't like me, don't invite me back. This isn't my job. <laughs> and, and so I uh, started doing interim work and, and had some really great learning experiences. And, and, uh, and again, found that, that I could be an encouragement to others. Mm-hmm. And so in life, ministry sometimes is you're preparing for one thing and doing the best you can, and God is simply using it for the next next step. Mm-hmm. And as long as we focus on the kingdom, as Jesus said, uh, these other things fall into place, not always perfectly. You know, uh, nobody I know in ministry has had a, a, a smooth sail. You yeah. know, it's tough work, but then life is tough and life is complicated. Yeah. Well, and I think that, and so that's, that's, that's quite the that's quite the journey uh, that uh, that the Lord had you on, but I think that's such a good example of you know so many times we can be so focused on the destination and okay so this is where I'm heading and then we miss all the things along the way and and the way that I always kind of just describe it even just in my own life is because I'm very very destination driven and very production driven um, and you know I just as soon as I get in the car I want to arrive at the destination I, I miss some of those rest stops on the way that it would really benefit my soul, my spirit, and just probably even my family if we would yeah. pull off the road for a break and just soak in the beauty of the journey. Yeah. And yeah. and so regardless of whether it's full-time ministry or or not, you know, God has a ministry for each one of us and it's figuring out, okay, how do we find beauty in that journey um, as we're as we're you know, just continuing to to move forward. And I love yeah. that you just said, as long as we keep the kingdom at the forefront of our mind, because seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. And that a lot of times we can kind of twist scriptures like that, right? To be like, yeah. well, if I just focus on the Lord, then I'm going to get a million dollars, or I'm going to just yeah. you know, get to my yeah. dream job, or right. you know, right. whatever. But that's yeah. not necessarily what it means. Obviously, right. it means that that God is adding to our to our plate and to our um, even our vision as yeah. we do that. I think so many times uh, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, people focus on the wrong word. They focus on heaven. Mm. And, and Jesus wasn't just talking about getting us into heaven, but getting heaven into us. And kingdom is, means uh, that God is our king, that Christ is our Lord. And, and that means letting God mess, up with, mess your life up. Mm-hmm. I, I like what Frederick Buechner says, that God speaks in the everydayness of life, in the ordinary things. Uh, the day-to-day journey is a part of God's alphabet of grace. And, and God is speaking to us in seemingly the insignificant things. Uh, and yet those interruptions, those sidetracks turn out to be some of the most important things. Mm-hmm. I never planned on having any of my kids. They, they, we were they just, <laughs> kids happen. It's funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, so five months into marriage, uh, all of a sudden my wife's throwing up every morning. Yeah. You know, What's up with this? And then one week after our first anniversary, uh, two, a pair of twins are born. And I thought, this is, I don't know how to cope with this. And the, God, I want to change the world. And here you, oh, I've got twins. 
And yet, looking back, those you know those twins, and then Joe, six years later, comes along yeah. the same way. I was working on my doctorate when Joe came, and I never finished my doctorate, but that's okay, because I'd rather have Joe than a doctorate. <laughs> yeah. But um, again, don't do like I did. My life is just kind of, it's weird how it works out, but those big interruptions sometimes that we see as like, oh, now what, mm. turn out to be the very thing that God is going to use the most yeah. in your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. So the... The list is long of the roles that you have uh, <laughs> provided for the kingdom and, and in mm-hmm. people's lives. So, and, and obviously, there's joys and heartaches um, with with each role that we've had. I mean, yeah. there's joys and heartaches uh, sometimes in marriage. There's some joys and heartaches in, in our role as a parent, as a dad, mm-hmm. um, in our role as an executive or you know minister yeah. or whatever. Right. So, um, but are there roles that you truly have? Say, you know, Tom, those. That has really given that gave me a lot of joy. You mentioned the, the yeah. prison, um, and then yeah. on the other side of that, maybe one of the jo- the jobs that's just caused a little bit more of a heartache. Or, yeah, oof, that that was hard. Um, the greatest joy is honestly, again, to to know you had a small part to play in somebody's life, uh, mm-hmm. and then to watch that life. You know, like you, you know, watching you, you got, came to USF, and then to see this fired up kid get a vision for life and 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 go into ministry. Uh, there's nothing more rewarding than to know that I played a small part in the big journey, and mm-hmm. and and I think and small is an important part to play. Um, again, well, you played a pretty big part. We went to Mexico <laughs> together on a mission trip, and we both came back alive. You yes. know, which was touch and go for a lot while. So, yes, especially when that pickaxe came close to my head, I'll never forget. Yeah, it worked. I did big... that. I was not holding the pickaxe. No, no, okay, no. It, so was, uh, that's not... it was Jason Folkerts, yeah. and he was swinging, and I was not paying attention. Uh, but, but and, and that's another problem of attention deficit. But we'll get into that later. But no, just being a part of a uh, of a team. You know, I, yeah. I've loved that. I think the hardest thing. Uh, if you were ra- like many of us kids were raised in the prairie states, you know, it's non-confrontational. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't like confrontation. I hate get into conflict. And yet sometimes you got to choose your fight and you got to go for it. And uh, that's what keeps you up at night. When you know you made people angry, when you know you had to do or say something that wasn't the popular thing to do, uh, that is really hard. Mm-hmm. Um that on a on a professional level was the hardest thing ever. I've, I've never been fired. I've never been called in with any serious reprimands. Did get called in for like rappelling off the fire escape. Probably wasn't a good a good idea, and the president didn't like it. But man, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so doing some things like that, I, uh, you get in trouble. But but I think you know professionally, I've I've been thankful. That people have been looking out for me, and I've never had that moment like some of my friends have had, where they call you in and they say, sorry, we're going to go a different direction. Um, so those are tough times. Mm-hmm. You know, personally, the hardest thing was was going through divorce. Yeah. Uh, that was that was the hardest thing I've ever been through. Yeah. So and and, and I knew we were eventually going to get there. So let's let's go ahead since it since it kind of uh, just presented yeah. itself. That's one of the, th- the things, Dennis, that I, I really feel like um, there's several topics that the church mm. doesn't handle well mm. um, and doesn't yeah. really know how to respond to very well. Yeah. And I'm and yes, that's the local church, small C, but the big church and Christianity yeah. doesn't doesn't know really how to handle certain topics. And divorce is one of those one of those yeah. uh, things. And and you you went through a divorce um, mm. while you were the campus pastor at the University of Sioux Falls, yep. a private Christian yep. liberal arts university. Yep. Um, yep. You had three boys. Yep, you know, at the time, and so I'd love for you just to kind of, I guess, walk us through some of the some of the the things that you learned through that. Um, how what, what you thought about divorce leading up to that time. Yep. Um, how you process divorce being in ministry. How the church looked at that. Just unpack some of that for oh, us. Oh man. Well, first of all, I th- I thought I had that all figured out. You know, and and uh, I thought. First of all, it can't happen to me. Uh, and the strangest thing, you know, when I look back over my years of ministry, I realize um, when you want to go out and change the world and you have this high commitment to wanting to make all these changes, you forget that uh, it takes its toll on the loved ones around you. And uh, long story short, my my ex-wife ended up divorcing me and, and then married a, a co-worker of hers. And um, 
you know, I was not the easiest guy to live with. I was driven. Um, and, and I look back now and realize, uh, you know, every marriage makes its demands on people. And, um, as my marriage was slipping away, uh, I just re-intensified my efforts rather than maybe, you know, I tried, I, I tried, mm -hmm. um, and it was devastating. And I just assumed, uh, when my wife filed for divorce, I went to the boss at the school and I just said, I probably want to be looking for a campus pastor because I don't want to put the school through a scandal. Mm. And in many Christian organizations, it, that would be the, it. And I really was planning to become a truck driver. I mm. thought I'm going to do something so obscure that I can still be around for my kids, but I'll, I'll just make a living and go away. And uh, I thought that's what happened. And I'm one of those uh, exceptions to the story. You hear the horror stories. Uh, the church com community embraced me because I had been interim in a number of churches in the area. And they would go out of their way to look out for me and see how I was doing. The school uh, went through the whole thing, and the theology department, the board of trustees, and and it's a very humbling thing to go to your the head, you know the head of the trustees and say, oh, this is what happened. Is I understand if you don't want me around, and then to have them love you through that. Mm -hmm. uh, I in the I was treated so well by my boss. They 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 examined why is this divorce happening? What's going on? And was there infidelity or anything like that? And there wasn't anything on that on my part. And and uh, so the school stood with me, my the church stood with me, and um, I experienced so much grace in the renewal journey. Mm. Uh, and then the next test came because I got dumped, and and a woman named Ellen got dumped, and a mutual friend said, "Well, you both been dumped. Why don't you two dumpies <laughs> get together?" So the two dumpies met in Barnes and Noble one night for a cup of coffee, and. Uh, Eventually, Ellen and I got married. Yeah, and Ellen and I both realized that we live on Plan B. That this was not should have not have happened. It did happen. We got dumped, and God gave us a second chance. So I have my three sons. I have four stepsons now as well, mm -hmm. and uh, I am very thankful for. But that again rate, creates new theological questions. So there's some people that, well, you know, it's bad enough you got divorced, but to be remarried, well, now you got there's a verse here and a verse there that, well, how do you know you're not in adultery? <laughs> And that's where grace has seen us through, mm. you know, that I I think that the church, again, we can find rules, and, and the rules are helpful, and how do we work through these things, and how do we, uh, who do we keep in ministry, who do we disqualify, and for some Christian groups, I would be anathema. I couldn't, you know, I, uh, and, uh, but the community of grace that I've lived in, the grace, the communities of grace that I've been in, I've been able to... Uh, Keep preaching. I've been able to keep working at the school, and I think what I've learned is that grace uh, is the way to work through these these family disasters that hit. Rather than I, I had a friend who got shown the door within six months after the divorce, and it was again not his and it, his doing. Uh, and uh, when I was in seminary, we didn't talk about it. It was you know, we didn't talk about failure when I was in seminary. Right. You weren't that wasn't an option. In any way, marriage failure, professional failure, media we were not prepared for mediocrity in seminary. We were just told about greatness. Uh -huh. We read about great Christians and great churches. We never were told, you know what, most of you guys are just gonna be kind of kind of in the, <laughs> there's a thing called the bell curve, right? <laughs> and, and most of us fit in that big lump in the middle. And never did I hear in my th two and a half years of Christian college and my two and a half years of seminary. Uh, never did I hear anybody prepare me for mediocrity mm. and living in the middle of the hump. And, and Which yet, doesn't mean that you can't be significant or right. that God doesn't have a role. You already talked about the small yeah. part that you play, yeah. but, but I could see where that would be damaging to where if it's like, well, if I don't go and do this great thing like these yeah. people we read about or study or whoever, um, then that means that I must not be doing this right. Right, yeah. I did something wrong. I, uh, I, I'm not a great achiever, therefore I'm not an important person or something like that. And we get these weird, especially, I hate to sound sexist here, but I know guys, their competitive ego gets fed in so many different ways. And seminary for me was a competitive place. You know, it shouldn't have been, right? We should be, but I remember feeling inadequate. Mm -hmm. You're sitting under the tutelage of these PhDs and and you're you got the guys in the front row that are in you know they're all in 
And I'm sitting in the back of the world saying, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> and and <laughs> and thinking, uh, I think I'll skip tomorrow. You know, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it just... That's why I said, don't do what I did somehow, but somehow uh, I muddled through and, and uh, God has, uh, but, but with the thing again that I came back to with recovering from a divorce and then moving into a blended family was that uh, life has a way of humbling you and you learn from those things and you start going from that point on. Uh, you know, I, I, if I look back 40 years ago when I was now doing some postgraduate work, I'd already graduated from seminary, but I was doing a thing like CPE and clinical pastoral education, and I was taking a few more classes. Um, back then, I wanted to change the world. Now, you know, I realize I need to be changed. Mm. And, and that process is still happening. I'm still trying to grow up and mature. One of the statements that uh, that I heard early on in in ministry was, you know, we all have these aspirations to change the world, like you just yeah. said. Um, but what popped in my brain as you said that is, um, you know, we may not change the world, but we may change the world for one person. Right. right. And yeah. you know, and that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. That's when yeah. when we recognize, okay, look, it's not about this entire, you know, this big deal, but it's it's the body of work, how we've lived our lives the character that we've tried to, you know, live out in our marriage and in our relationships with our kids and our relationships with other people long term and how that changes the world of one person here, one person there and all of that. So I got to say that uh, Dennis so when when you know you you see this loving response from mm -hmm. from the school, from the church. Um you're you're pretty well connected. You'd done some inter interim work. Um, mm -hmm. There wasn't a moral failure that led mm -hmm. to the to mm -hmm. the divorce and all of that. So that helped you not feel like a failure too much. But yet you said that you did yeah. recognize that you were a factor. Yeah. That yeah. You, that your drivenness. Um, that there were some things that maybe you yeah. left undone or unsaid at home or whatever because you're out here doing yeah. quote unquote great yeah. things for others in the kingdom. Um, so I'm just thinking about. You know some of the guys that may be listening right now mm -hmm. um, that haven't been embraced, yeah, that yeah. haven't been encouraged um, with their divorce experience, and they've been responded to in a whole different way. Um, is there any kind of, I guess, encouragement that that you could give yeah. them as a perspective that you could give yeah. them? Yeah, um, boy, self talk is is. So critical at this point to remember to remind ourselves that we are, as Henry Nouwen would say, the beloved of Christ, that we are loved, that we are not loved for what we can achieve, but for being simply for being uh, to deal with uh, the judgment of the world and still be able to look yourself in the in the mirror and say, you know, doggone it, I tried. Um, I think that's what I want on my gravestone. I, I tried, you know, <laughs> for what it's worth, you know, it's, it's just, I, I, we, we, um, the world is more than ever, the bullying, the online snarkiness, we have become a very, very caustic culture. Mm. And, and it's sad because I, at times I've fed into that too. We, we belittle and we, we don't hear the voice of God that says, you are the beloved, you know, as, as Nouwen said. And, of course, the interesting thing with Henry Nouwen is I've, I've always loved him. Uh, he was highly successful, yet he always considered himself a loser, an outsider, a misfit. And, and he said, yeah, it's easy for you to say, Henry, you wrote the books and you were, <laughs> uh, you know, beloved by many. And yet it, it's, it's, in spite of that, that you look at Henry and say, no, no, what he said was just a simple voice of, of allowing ourselves to be loved by God. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. And then the, 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 thing, the thing of, of having to let go of, you know, I, I, going through divorce changes the way you pray the Lord's Prayer. You mm. know, because every time I pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, you realize uh, how much sin tampers with life and being sinned against uh, and then realizing rather than becoming self-righteous about my ex, realizing, no, I sinned against my my ex in ways that were inconsiderate and thoughtless. And she mm -hmm. married an immature kid. And um, I, and 
it's not me elevating myself over another person when I pray, pray the Lord's Prayer, but it is very much coming back to that thing of, am I a kingdom seeker? Am I a forgiver? Am I willing to embrace forgiveness? And am I willing to just ask for daily bread rather than for a great thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, the road to, you know, it's that, that journey. It's funny, the things that I think now, and as I'm closing out on, on the end of my career, uh, is that the things that I thought were so important 40, 45 years ago, uh, now I realize are just parts of a bigger picture that mm -hmm. the really, it really does boil down to faith, hope, and love. <laughs> You know, yeah. I had this little ditty that I'm the world's worst rapper, but you know, when I was a young man, I was always a fan of those called a spiritual giant. But now that I'm old, I see the pure gold of a soul that is simply compliant. It's not great achievements which we must pursue as we ponder the things that God calls us to do. For when we are called to our home up above, the legacy we must leave is faith, hope, and love. So there's my last. Rap. Oh my goodness! You just heard it, man. That's just drop, that's just, you just dropped a single on us. You just you just dropped a single. This oh that that's that was gold. That was gold right there. That that was that was podcast gold right there for sure. <laughs> um, but I'm assuming this. So when you talk about, so in, you, even just looking back over the last 45, 40 years, whatever, and the things that you place so much focus on, mm -hmm. um, you just, you're like, okay, boy, small parts or boy, that really wasn't as big as a, of a deal as I thought it mm -hmm. was. Right. Or as monumental of a thing. Yeah. Um, so I gotta, I gotta ask like, as you're, as you're entering into this, you had, had your divorce, you then enter into your your new marriage with Ellen. I'm imagining though that there were still some things that saying, okay, I need to do some things differently. Yeah. As yeah. I because we we obviously can't change the past. Yeah. Um, and no matter how much we'd like to. Right. Um, and so, but you said, okay, but I can change the present and moving forward. So, what were some of those things that you said? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter with a new mindset here. Well, one thing. Uh, Ellen, my wife, is a counselor, re recently retired. Uh, and when you marry a counselor, you're, um, you know, we're always in this conversation between theological concepts and psychological aspects. And, and you know, one of the things that my wife has, has really taught me is you got to listen to your life. Uh, and it's, a, it's an old Frederick Buechner and, a, and, and many other writers talking about that same thing, too. Again, you know, you got to listen to your life and what is God saying uh, right now? And, and you do... You know, I think so many times God is shouting at us in our circumstances, but we're not hearing it. Um, and so sometimes the most obvious things uh, just take a while to get our attention, and then we have to process them. I have, because I have attention deficit, I uh, frustration, I have to process my frustrations. I, 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 I get impatient, I get restless, and, and it takes me about, oh, a good 12 hours to process something. Sometimes that... <laughs> that means my wife has to live with a crab for for a while, <laughs> you know. But but learning to 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 unlearn uh, old ways of thinking and then saying, get moving on in a in a new direction. Um, there just always is something more to to develop, uh, and and the whole thing is character. You know, we spend most of our spiritual lives in prayer, praying about our circumstances. But when you look at the great prayers of the Bible, most of them are focused on character. Mm. You know, God, not don't change that, but change me, mm. especially in the Pauline epistles. Um, so learning to be to be a now the the stage of my life is uh, how do I be a better grandfather? Mm. Uh, which having my five year old granddaughter at a sleepover mm. Saturday night meant that Sunday morning at First Baptist when I preached, uh, don't go looking up this sermon, folks. It wasn't that great because I was a little <laughs> foggy brain. Uh, it was not very organized, but. Honestly, I think in the in the big picture of the kingdom, the, the good people at First Baptist, they're fine. <laughs> they got through with a muddled sermon, but uh, Kate needed me Saturday yeah. night, yeah. and and my little five year old uh, granddaughter was was worth that. Yeah. Um, so just learning to that's probably the next stage of my life is learning to uh, to be that grandpa mm. that I need to be. Yeah. The the term you know listening to your life. Um, mm. Is, is such a great one, but a lot of times we don't want to do that. You know, yeah, we don't want to yeah. take the time to just sit. I mean, number one, we don't want to sit and be still, right? I mean, we yeah. want to grab a device. We want to um, find some way to escape. 
uh, whatever kind of situation we're in. And, and when we're alone with our thoughts, that's when things get a little scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's when things yeah. get a little bit like, oh my gosh, what in the world's <laughs> happening and whatever. But, yeah. but it's so crucial if there's going to be growth. Yeah, and I yeah. think about the you know the podcast that I did with um, Rob Lone several uh, several weeks uh, months ago now a month, couple months ago now um, where he talked about you know now and go to one of the greatest things that we can uh, give our loved ones is to be a growing person, and yeah. when we when we really take that to heart um, and being a growing person, we got to learn lean into those things that we don't necessarily want to learn from. And so that we can have some of that self-discovery. I think that can happen, obviously, through other people, too, having relation, tight relationships with other dudes and other people. Um, for you, even just to process that without Ellen. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. But then she, of course, brought in you know, her own oh, yeah. Like, yeah. life learnings as well. And oh, so yeah. then you're journeying yeah. through that together. Oh, um, man, <laughs> man. You know, and and uh, one of the th- you know, when you think about the developmental lifestyle, uh, milestones in your life. Um, for us, you know, we thought, you know, so here we are, we're remarried, we're, she's a counselor, she's well-established, I'm a pastor, well-established. So then what happens? One of our stepsons, one of Ellen's sons, uh, through a strange and bizarre chain of events, becomes addicted to meth. Mm-hmm. And uh, wow, I thought I'd worked with prison inmates, I'd worked with dysfunctional families professionally. But then for me, uh, when I started to deal with addiction in our family mm. and my co-addictive personality, and, uh, you know, God, thank God, uh, Jesse has next month, he'll have three months of sobriety. Mm. And awesome. so my stepson, who is one of my great inspirations at this point, you know, because Jesse went through hell uh, with his addic- crazy addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the things you learn uh, along the way, again, are there's you're never done learning. And, um, there will be other things to learn too, mm-hmm. and uh, so you know, I I, uh, I would never wish any of those things on anybody, but um, I'm thankful the insights I've learned from um, my stepson's journey of recovery uh, have helped me to see the world in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah, go, going through the experience of something that, I mean, I'm sure there's been times when you have had to counsel other parents about, you know, their concerns for their kids, mm-hmm. um, whether that be, you know, when they come to the campus and you see them making some poor decisions, and just because it's a Christian school doesn't mean there's not issues. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> you know, that that's, yeah. there's there's plenty of, of need and, and all of yeah. that and um, behavior that necessarily isn't, you know, focused on the Lord, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm sure there's there's many conversations that you've said, okay, yep, you're concerned about your kid, here's what I would do. But all of a sudden mm-hmm. now you're in that situation yeah. and you're thinking about yeah. all those things that you've shared and how yeah. maybe some of those things aren't necessarily as helpful to you in your situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just figuring that out. Um, so I got. So let me ask you, as as a as a yes, it's a stepfather situation, but it's still he's your kid, right? right. Um, you're seeing the downward spiral that he's on. You're grieving. You, you mm-hmm. see him really struggling. I know there's listeners right now that their kids are wayward. Their kids yeah. are struggling. Yeah. Um, what? Where can they find their hope and not give yeah. up on their kid? Yeah. Um, you know, you get you find when when you're having something this crazy as addiction, and there there are many different kinds of addictions yep. out there. That number one, your anger wants to dominate, and the the wrath of humanity, as James says, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. As righteously indignant, I went to an AA meeting with my stepson one time, and mm-hmm. one of the other recovering addicts said something that I've never forgotten. One of the other addicts said. He said, to me, righteous indignation is more addictive than alcohol. Oh, man, Mm. because it is. You get that adrenaline push when you're morally right and they're morally wrong, and it's so clear. You know, I'm right. I'm not the meth addict. But then all of a sudden we become angry and we want to fix. And and as a parent, I I think all too often I found myself – being fueled by my moral indignation. You know, why is this room a mess you know, with the kids? Or, or why didn't you do your paper out? Or, you know, there's so many things that a parent can get upset about. And that rage is that anger can easily move into rage because the more outrageous the situation gets. Mm. But I, I, as an adult, 
having a child, a stepson, in his adult years move into addiction, um, I learned how unhelpful my anger was. And, I, and so my word of encouragement to any parent that's struggling with their kid right now is, is be careful and get some help in being able to ventilate your anger in a healthy way. You know, go to the gym, go to counseling, find friends that you can commiserate with. Uh, the other thing is, is the, the problem of problem solving is we want to fix. Mm-hmm. And especially we Christians have a, you know, a strong sense of right and wrong and how to fix things. And some things don't get fixed easily. Uh, it's mm-hmm. a complex mystery, the journey of recovery the journey of getting anybody out of an entangled mess is not a simple fix. But we love quick fixes. We love simple answers. And um, life is not that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, some things are, are are pretty clear, but even clear answers don't always work themselves out clearly in, in the everyday living. So, um, yeah, I learned, I learned the hard way that I need to just be in the moment again and have the people around me that I can, I can trust that I can talk to. Um, and to have somebody that to have safe people in your life is really critical. Mm-hmm. And many men isolate more than many women do. And so they tend to not have enough safe people. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that, Dennis. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and I know that that was probably something that, the at least, you know, one or two dudes out there needed to hear <laughs> because, you know, we, we, we love our kids so much, yeah. you know, and we yeah. want the best for them so much. And, you know, sometimes it's that, that causes us to like the emotion to rise up so quick because we're like, can't you see what you're doing? You know, or, exactly. or yeah. you know, in the yeah. case of like cleaning a room or <laughs> paper yeah. out or whatever, I mean, oh my goodness, I just, I wasted so much emotion, you know, when my <laughs> yeah. kids were little, right? On yeah. just yeah. silly things that I thought were, you know, important yeah. because, you know, how they clean their room is going to be how they, how their house is clean when they're 42, yeah. you know, or whatever. Like, I mean, whatever <laughs> stuff we, we yeah. put into our heads, right? Yeah. But yeah. it's just understanding that that um, that it's not helpful, and it's just it's raising. Laura always did tell me about just the the you know don't exasperate your children, right? Yeah. I mean, Proverbs says, do not exasperate yeah. your children. Yeah. Um, and sometimes my behaviors and my responses, yeah, really just that's what it did. It, it wasn't yeah. helpful at all, you know. And even in the moment, I'm like, I know this isn't helpful, but it, but that's why to have it um, where you can do it in healthy ways. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That connection with other people yeah. um, that can that you can just process and think yeah. and just and then and pray. I mean, yeah. Yeah. that's the one thing is is that you know to remember that God loves our kids more than we than we do. Yeah, which seems yeah. unfathomable, right? But He does, and just to continue to say, God, you know. We just want to see you work in his life, his or her life, because you know. Yeah, the the the, the prayer community. You know, the it was in the '90s. This was a controversial statement, uh, but a politician's wife made about it takes a village to raise a child, but it really does. You mm-hmm. know, let's depoliticize that. I am so thankful that my sons had uh, a great youth pastor because you can't be a pastor to your own kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, that <laughs> yeah. uh, they had uh, coaches that cared about them. They had friends and uh, that it, uncles and aunts, that it does take a, a, you know, it takes a village to raise a healthy child. And, and again, in our society, we're less village oriented now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we don't necessarily all, all have a healthy community. I am so thankful in the life of my own kids for that extended community, which was able to be, I think that's, we don't, we don't talk about that enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so just a couple more questions, then we, and then we'll end up our time together here. But you've been studying the Word for a long time, Dennis, and um, you've been preaching the Word a long time. Uh, one of the things that I always uh, loved when I sat underneath uh, and listened to your messages when I was in college, and even since the few that I've been able to hear, is that you know you can find these little obscure truths in Scripture and, and communicate them in a way that I think is just is just super fun, and and not only just truths, but also just characters in the Bible and just um, stories that that you know resonate with you mm-hmm. or or whatever. So, is there is there a particular character? And I hate to use the word character because they're real people, mm-hmm. but like character in the Bible or story that that just is that you love sharing that has been influential influential yeah. in your life as you think of your life as a man. You know, it's interesting. I 
I find Luke so compelling because of his heart for the outsiders as well. You know, Luke is talking in, uh, about Gentiles and women and, and things like that. And um, a few years back in reading through the first two chapters of, of the Christmas story in Luke, but not getting to Christmas, getting to Mary and her cousin Elizabeth and uh, these nobodies, and reading uh, about Zechariah and Joseph and how they have to come alongside their wives in these unusual pregnancies, I've, I've been so drawn to, what I just, for lack of a better term, the significance of the insignificant. I mean, there's nothing more obscure than a Galilean peasant in Nazareth, of all places, all of a sudden becoming pregnant by the Holy Spirit and her cousin being pregnant by natural means, but when she's past menopause down in, in Jerusalem area and watching these two cousins work through this incredible journey that took years. You know, Mary was slut shamed for the next 33 years. Mm -hmm. And and in that call, I grew up in a small town in South Dakota. I know how <laughs> your the, the family story sticks with you, but it it's nothing like this in an all it's worse in an honor culture. So I look at Mary and Joseph and how they were dishonored uh, for 33 years, and Joseph went to his grave, never seeing the vindication in, mm. in his earthly life uh, for the hard journey they went through to bring the Savior to the world. Um, so to me, I am so drawn to the first two chapters of Luke. And then the shepherds show up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> these losers, these, yeah. the, the other, these cowboys that have no, no social status, and they're the first ones at the manger. Mm. And... Um, to, to go read those stories and get the Christmas uh, story. You know, we're, we're so used to songs in the background and tinsel right. and all that. <laughs> but to just read the Christmas story in those in Matthew, in Luke, I mean, yeah. and see the, the significance of the insignificant, the, see God at work in hidden places, and to realize that the secret work of God in this kingdom is, is, is far greater than we can imagine. That's what I'm drawn to. Yeah, yeah. That's good, and it's it's very appropriate timing to to be able to discuss that uh, uh, right now as well. Um, so that's that's perfect. I think that that even as as I know we read that story right every yeah. uh, every year. I'm sure a lot of families do, and and to be able to think and process that through those that lens, I think is crucial for us in understanding like the, the how how big of a deal the coming of Christ was. I mean, we know that was a big deal, yeah. but even just the the key role players. Oh, yeah. um, that uh, that uh, played the role in, in in bringing the Savior to the earth. Um, okay, so uh, one final question before we get to what we call the final word, where you get okay. to just kind of share a final word with okay. with listeners. But um, you mentioned a few minutes ago about just the role of of character and how mm -hmm. oftentimes we want in our prayers we want God to change our circumstances yeah. as opposed to changing us in our character. And one of the things that we've seen over the last several years, um, and I mean, not just several years, but I think just with the amount of media that we can consume and how news is delivered to us now, we're just made mo so much more aware mm -hmm. of, of people that haven't finished well. Yeah. Of yeah. men that, yeah. Uh, that maybe lived one way on the stage, one way off the yeah. stage. That weren't in alignment with each other. Um, obviously, you've got sports stars mm -hmm. and celebrities and singers and all that kind of stuff. But we've seen you know, ministers mm -hmm. that have, mm -hmm. have fallen. And and I appreciate that. You know, here you are. You said you know that you're you're hitting your 69th year and you're just kind of figuring out. Okay, Lord, I'm going to. Sail off into the sunset, I think, is the word that you used there, um, which I don't know if you're going to do that on Wall Lake here or where you're going to really sail into a sunset here in Sioux Falls. But but at any rate, um, finishing well is is so crucial. Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. So um, what, Dennis, how, how do you, how does, how does Dennis Toome uh, finish well? Not just in your yeah. career. Yeah, right, right. But just in, you know, if God gives you another 25 years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's. It's weird because you spend your life defining yourself as a man by what you do. You know, what, what, what's your name? What do you do for a living? Those kind of things yeah. I always think. And suddenly to realize that that um, I am soon coming to a time, I don't know when, but it's not going to be that far down the road yet, where I will no longer be defining myself by what I do or what I did. You know, that mm. oh, I used to be a minister. Now, you know, to be able, can I go into a conversation and not say, well, here's what I did for a living 
or here's what my kids are doing or anything. Like that. But just to say, this is who I am and this is uh, the things that make me alive today. Um, I, I think that, you know, the sake, again, the sacredness of the ordinary, that to, um, to integrate the holiness of our calling into whatever we're doing, uh, being, being a decent human being. I did a funeral. I've done a number of funerals lately, and it's interesting to stand by the graveside. I, I, I did a, a graveside service for a man who had one of the hardest lives I've ever known. Mm -hmm. uh, a man from this city who uh, was unwanted by his mother, raised by his grand, uh, grandmother, couldn't go to high school because uh, there was no money. Uh, it was only not that many, just a few years older than me and uh, had one of the hardest lives I've ever known. And yet one of the kindest, most decent souls I've ever known. And um, if you were to define this man by what he did, he, he had an ordinary life that did ordinary things and he didn't always do everything perfectly. But you stand by the graveside of somebody like that, and it's a privilege to be the last person to announce over that life, this was a good man. Mm. This was goodness. And sorry, I'm getting a little verklempt. <laughs> yeah. about but being, being would that when, when my day comes and they stand by my grave uh, and they see I tried on the gravestone, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that they will just be able to say he tried to the end to try to do God's will. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I realize that many of the greatest people that have ever walked this planet are not recognized by humanity. They were those salt of the earth people that worked in the ordinary day, things of life, and they're the true heroes in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Their name's not on a building. They're not <laughs> yeah. known for anything, but yet they, they were faithful. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Dennis, yeah. that's one thing that, that I'm just appreciative for you for is that you've just been faithful. You know, you've been faithful to the Lord in, in all the different things that he's had you, the roles that he's had you in, most importantly, not just your roles, but just in people's lives, you know, and I mean, you you invested uh, in me, and you're right. I mean, I was like this, I was a skinny 19-year-old punk that had an <laughs> ego uh, that had a lot of issues that, um, you know, wore a lot of masks, you know, and and you invested in, in me, and, you know, the... I'm doing my small part in what God has me doing right now because of people like you that invested in me. And so it's an honor to share this space and, and uh, have this time in conversation uh, at a table together. And that hopefully uh, some people enjoyed listening in on today. <laughs> I, I know they did, but we, you, and you and I could continue to talk and banter and, and laugh and, and say goofy things together all day long. But um, before we sign off today, I would love just to have you uh, give our listeners and viewers a, a final word, you know, 60 sure. to 90 seconds of just whatever the Lord lays on your heart to, to share okay. as, as your final word. Now, this isn't your final word ever, because <laughs> I mean, you've got a lot, you've got a lot, as I, as I say that, and after we just talked about what we talked about, I'm like... Wait, yeah. this sounds like it's like he's <laughs> riding out of the sunset now, but no, oh, like you're no. playing over it for today. <laughs> yeah, no, it always comes back to grace. You know, to yeah. me, you know, we, 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 we too often see grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, to me, grace is God's response after crappy experiences. <laughs> you know, that grace is God rolling up his sleeves and engaging in our lives. And uh, so, again, to wax as the world's worst hip-hop artist, I can say it this way. Yeah. Uh, before I end today, I got something to say about this spiritual life we call a race. There's a lot of places to go and lots of things to do, but in the end, it's all about grace. Because grace isn't about your commitment to God, it's about God's commitment to you. And when it's all said and done, it's a victory Jesus won that really has to see us through. So. <laughs> That's it. Grace, man. Man, we got we got we dropped a single in the middle and we dropped a single at the end. Dennis, and, uh, I so I'm a one trick pony. I'll never <laughs> yeah. do another another routine, but that's Oh fine. my goodness, I love it. I just can't wait till we release all your hits on one. Oh, yeah. uh, it's actually going to come on a record. I think it's actually that's how long you've been doing these rounds. It's going to come on an actual record that we can listen to in in all its glory. All right. Dennis, thank you so much. This has been super fun. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for taking the time and joining us. Here. I know that God is has got uh, a phenomenal here. However many years you got left to USF <laughs> ahead of you, but and I know that God's going to continue to use even after you retire from the school, which will leave a huge hole. Um, but at, just thank you for your faithfulness. Yeah. Thanks for your investment in me and in thousands of college students and thousands of lives over the last, uh, I mean, throughout your entire life. And thanks for being here today. Thank you for privilege. 
Thanks for listening in on this episode of the Giving Life Podcast. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dennis Toom and that you found it to be both encouraging and helpful. If you did, be sure to send it on to others in your relational world that may find it helpful as well. Also, if you haven't followed or subscribed to the podcast yet, be sure to do that prior to signing off for the day so that you're all dialed in for the next episode when it drops. All right, thanks again for joining me, everybody. I look forward to seeing you next time for another episode of ResGen's Giving Life Podcast. Until then, continue being men whose life in Christ gives life to others. We'll see you.